I feel like if there was ever a conspiracy to try and launch a book, a ton of free speech furors at some of America's highest education institutions might very well be it. So I'm not saying that you and Greg started all of this stuff <laughs> off, but I am saying that it seems to be conveniently timed. Yeah, um, I we convinced all of the Ivy League and elite institutions to just self-detonate exactly as we were dropping this book about how terrible and dire the state of free speech is on their campus and the state of discourse. So I knew it's it. been an interesting time for sure. Also, often an unideal time to be a vocal free speech absolutist um, because it requires that you defend speech that is often very heinous, even in the depths of an unfolding crisis. Um, but certainly, I think we're seeing the the consequences of decades of just the these major elite institutions in America just abdicating the value of free speech, completely throwing it to the wayside, and then allowing radicalism and, and some really frightening illiberal tendencies to fester in its place. What has happened to the rates of calls for cancellation over the last few years? It's been absolutely staggering. And since 2014, um, FIRE, which is my, my co-author, Greg Lukianoff, is the, the president of the Foundation for Individual Rights and Expression. And they've tallied more than a thousand attempts to get professors fired, 200 of which have been successful in getting them sanctioned. Um, and that actually is twice the rate of the uh, 10 years that roughly constitute what McCarthyism was. And so if we're looking back in historical context, we look at that as a horrendous blight on our record as a country in terms of, you know, firing people for ideological reasons. And we are now outstripping that at roughly twice the pace. So I think in the future, historians will be looking back at this moment in time and studying it much as we did, um, and rightfully so, the 1950s. What is driving this increase? Why is it ramping up so much? What are the, the undercurrents that are causing this thing to happen? Yeah, so I think the the major catalyst here and why we define cancel culture as starting in 2014 in its modern iteration is because social media allows it to just take off like wildfire. And we um, we kind of refer to Richard Dawkins's idea of a meme because cancel culture is very uh, it's very effective. You know, you don't have to actually engage with somebody's argument. You just attack them ad hominem. You make an example of them. You make sure that no one else wants to tread the same ideological path as them. And in the end, people see that and watch that and replicate that. And I think that social media has allowed for an unprecedented amount of scrutiny on institutions, ideas, and people, which of course is a good thing. However, we're in one of those like post-printing press moments of social unrest where we haven't yet figured out how to navigate this world in which now billions of people are in the cultural conversation and um, and anyone could be to torn down at any moment unceremoniously, fairly, unfairly. And so I think, you know, this is our book is a, an attempt to call it to attention to the issue and also um, hopefully get more people on board to figuring out how we get out of this mess, because I think that there actually is a lot of um just general desire and, and a general understanding that that things have gone too far, that people are walking on eggshells and that that's not a healthy way to live. Right. So if you're saying that the distribution mechanism of social media, frictionless, free communication, ubiquitous, instantly globally mm -hmm. accessible, that is, that's almost like the delivery mechanism driving the virus in some way. Is there anything deeper than that? Or is the main driver of this just the fact that humans have perverse incentives, there are a bunch of strange things that go on in our psychology, and when the opportunity arises to be able to do this, it activates something inside of us? Or has there been a deeper cultural change too that's driven the cancellation increase? Yeah, I mean, I think that the the, the seeds have been sown for decades here where we've just seen a general um, institutional creep away from free speech values, a generational creep as well. Um, and we we definitely believe that cancel culture started in its um, kind of fledgling form on American campuses in the 80s and 90s when the first wave of political correctness was coming around. Like Bill Maher was doing the politically incorrect show before I was even born. And it was kind of laughable at that point in time. But then all of a sudden, as soon as social media came onto the forum, front and Gen Z, unfortunately, my generation came to college campuses and began unceremoniously shouting down and tearing down their professors. Um, it exploded out into the open in a way that it hadn't really historically. However, um, 
the the creep away from classical liberal values has been consistent. Um, and, you know, one thing that was really frightening writing this book is realizing how different Greg, my co-author, is um, nearing 50 and I'm 23. So we have totally different generational span. And the the old idioms and kind of um, kind of foundational principles of American society that he grew up with, like to each his own and sticks and stones. I wasn't raised with any of them. Um, we, I was, I was raised with words can wound you and um, oppressed people need to be protected and and you need to be the the warrior to step in on their behalf lest they be offended. And it's just a fundamental flip. And I think that it, as a culture, we've just moved more towards protectionism and and a feeling that we're all feeble rather than this resilient sort of anti fragile framework that used to be kind of core to to. The American spirit, I think. It's the British, it's the British spirit too, you know, like yeah. stiff upper lip. That's yeah. what we were known for, the stiff upper lip. And, you know, <clears throat> um, mustn't grumble. Mustn't yeah. grumble. Things are going badly, but mustn't grumble. Uh, yeah, there's a increase in fragility, right? A rampant fragility. But it's not... It, it's hollow because it's not like there's an actual change. People are living longer than ever before. People have got mm-hmm. better health care than ever before. You're more able to deal with anything from the car accident to the bad weather to the heat to the cold to whatever it is. So it's odd that you have real-world situations going in one direction whilst perceptions of how bad it is going in another. But just how bad is it now? Like what what – stats have you found to back up just how many people are being cancelled or or what the the sense the cultural thermometer is saying yeah i mean fire does these tremendous surveys of student sentiment around the country and we know that roughly two-thirds of students on college campuses say that they're self-censoring um we also know that roughly 90 percent of professors say the same and that one in ten have been investigated for what they're what should be protected speech um and so i think that one of the things that's interesting is there there tends to consistently be ebbs and flows of cancel culture where where people say, oh, it's behind us. And like, it's no, it's no longer an issue. 2016 was a rough moment, but like now we're back to normal. And then the pandemic happens and it's even worse in the wake of 2020. And then, oh no, maybe we're back to normal. And then the Israel-Palestine conflict erupts. And it's just anytime there's a moment of social unrest, a a culture that is not actually deeply rooted in its free speech values will tend towards liberalism, censorship, um, attacking disagreeers or dissenters from the predominant viewpoint. And I think that we see that time and again. And every single time, it's been getting more severe. So if you look at the caseloads that FIRE um, gets from students and faculty across the country, uh, 2020 was a record-breaking year, despite the fact that kids weren't even on campuses. So they had an unprecedented caseload. And, you know, if you also look at the the raw statistics of the surveys of, of Americans, consistently roughly four and five Americans will agree that political correctness has gone too far, that cancel culture is a problem, that they feel that they have to self Sensor. And I think it's genuinely a tyranny of the minority. It's just the problem is that that remaining 20% squeaky wheels who actually do tear people down have such an outsized impact on society where we're all self-censoring. And I felt that myself being a, an NYU student in the, the recent past, for sure. What was your experience on campus like when you got there? I had gone to a um, a boarding school that was almost like a mini college before, so I feel like I was kind of primed by the time I arrived at NYU. Um, my freshman year of high school was the first time that I realized I just did not agree with the the prevailing viewpoint. Um, when they on Martin Luther King Day as put all the kids in different buildings based on their race to talk about their racial experience. And I remember being like, this is kind of the opposite of how I've been taught to uh, internalize the the lessons of Martin Luther King Jr. And um, yeah, so that was, I knew by the time I arrived at NYU that I was uh, kind of going against the grain. And when I did get there, I was understandably, I think, in retrospect, concerned for my social standing. And so I was hiding Thomas Sowell books and Jordan Peterson books under my bed, which is really embarrassing in retrospect. And like now I've been on Jordan's podcast and I'm super canceled and, you know, booted from every group chat that I was in basically at NYU. But um, it was generally a 
an ideologically oppressive environment, I would say. I, I rarely heard dissenting viewpoints. Um, I took I, I did a two years of a humanities degree before dropping out despite having a 4.0 GPA because, you know, full tuition for Zoom school was not going to happen. Um, but I would say that generally it was one way or the highway. Kids would even try occasionally to pop into philosophical conversations and say, you know, to play devil's advocate and then present some unpopular opinion. And they would literally be scoffed and hissed at consistently. So um, I would, it just, it made me self-censor. And I realized once I started writing for the New York Post and being outspoken finally in the pandemic, that so many people around me reached out to me privately and said, you know, i I completely agree with you. And I've been in a classroom with them and I would never have known because, you know, cancel culture and liberalism thrives by making everyone feel alone. But even at a school like NYU, there there were a considerable number of kids who actually did feel similarly oppressed but um, or ideologically oppressed, but didn't feel that they could speak out and and didn't have any examples around them. It's strange to think if that's the case, 66% of students are self-censoring in some form or another on campus, but that there will be a good chunk of those students that will hiss and and mock mm -hmm. if you try to even steal man, let alone actually have a different opinion. I know it seems like it's it's I'm wondering what is motivating those people to be so vehement in their enforcement of a particular ideology that 66% of them don't agree with, or at least have criticisms mm -hmm. of. Like, what's the? I, I'm trying to work out what's the incentive. What what's in it for the canceller? Mm, well, I think that the the there's like a kind of cluster B personality type that's really been um, empowered on campuses. I think, and and people who are, I think, genuine believers at a place like NYU. I, there are a considerable fraction of people who who generally believe that if they step in on behalf of some, you know, oppressed theoretical group that might be offended by something that you say, which by the way, they're almost never the demographic of people that they're defending. But I think that there's a moral high ground to it and um and and a sense of righteousness. And I, I would even go as far as to say like a bit of like a, a religious kind of attitude towards it. Like I I think of John McWhorter's book Woke Racism and and the idea that um this is kind of supplanting this like this ideology in a in a post faith world is oftentimes occupying that same part of the the human psyche i would say um but also it's so institutionalized at these colleges as well i think that even even if not every professor agrees with it certainly the administrators are extremely disproportionately left wing or left leaning and when I was at NYU, for example, we on the back of our ID cards, it says, here's 911. Here's the phone number for the campus police, which you probably could theoretically need in New York City at any point in time. And here's the the student health center and all these emergency numbers. And then also the bias response hotline where you could call if you felt aggrieved or offended by something that someone said. And it's it, literally an institutionalized snitch culture on these campuses. And it was literally on the back of the bathroom stalls too. They'd have like posters of like, has something happened to you? Call the bias response hotline and you're, you know, immediately on the phone with an administrator. So I, you're walking on eggshells. And even if it is just a small percentage of kids who will hiss or who will call you any sort of isterism um, or a phobe at any any opportunity, just one kid doing that is enough to shut an entire class down, I believe. And I, I saw it firsthand. Yeah, it's a, a very effective leverage. One person that has that. What's that? Um panopticon it's kind of like the panopticon right that you have one person that's able to be in the middle and manipulate an awful lot of people around them's opinions mm -hmm. and the fear <clears throat> it's a race to the bottom in that regard like whoever has the most the highest purity level is the one whose opinion is is going to continue to be pushed forward what was that analysis of mass twitter bans that you guys looked mm -hmm. at yeah, they found um, this is this is data that we got from the National Contagion Research Institute, and they followed the growth of the platform Gab as Twitter did mass bans and purges of accounts that were um, at various times associated with like Infowars or um, there were I think post Charlottesville there were groups of um, that they'd identified as white supremacists and Proud Boys, 
And they would do these mass bans and purges of accounts starting around 2016. And then literally in lockstep, there would be a mass exodus to Gab every single time. And the, the percentage of uh, of Gabs that included the word ban would go up by like a factor of 10. And so we we analyzed that data basically to demonstrate that when we do fight ideas that could be very offensive and unsavory, and and I I understand why people are offended by white supremacist views and proud boy views. I'm not defending them. However, when you remove them from from the the common square in places where they might interact with other viewpoints or where they might get quote tweeted and publicly shamed, you end up creating even deeper and more entrenched echo chambers. And so we were very fortunate to get this data from NCRI because we now can provably say that censorship does not make these ideas go away. It just puts them into more obscure crevices of the internet where people are more likely to agree and have a positive feedback loop. So um, we we were extremely fortunate that that had not been published before um, we had done this book. And, and I think it's a, a demonstration of the importance of a platform actually tacking towards free speech because those views are not gone. They're just somewhere else and none of us hear about them, but they very much exist in, in another crevice of the internet. What do you think cancellation is trying to achieve? Like what well, you've just explained there, it doesn't seem to work. It pushes these ideas underground in some regard. It can throw them into echo chambers where there are presumably no dissenting voices. What What is it trying to achieve? I mean, I think it's just predicated on a... Like a fundamental misunderstanding of how how dialogue works and how minds are changed and hearts and, and minds are won over. I think I think there's been such a an alienation from the classical liberal values post enlightenment that that made society free and and made dialogue robust and made debate healthy and um, in the realm of ideas and not ad hominem. And you know, for for example, I I've, I've never learned. John Stuart Mill's On Liberty. I never learned the importance of free speech I'd, growing up, even going to great schools and doing a philosophy degree at NYU. I didn't understand the importance and and just how profound those post-enlightenment ideals are and how much they need to be bought into by the entire culture and community in order to thrive. And I think that those some people who engage in cancel culture are genuinely need-spirited, but other people, I think, do believe that if they shut down and, I don't know, castigate anybody who has a bad belief, that that somehow actually does expunge it from society, which is provably untrue. I think it's it's polarized us even further. Um, but I, I do think that it's just because people are are no longer taught the the importance of you know, he who knows only his side of the argument knows little of that and and the importance of being able to exist in the realm of ideas. And then, frankly, it's just an easy, cheap tactic to win arguments without winning arguments, because if I can attack you for being a cishet white male, I don't actually have to deal with the fact that you might have an ideological argument that that corners me or makes me uncomfortable in my own predispositions. What are some of the mechanisms for enforcing cancellation that people might not realize are part of the cancellation machine? I would say one thing that people seem not to talk enough about is how early it's starting. And especially in the in the social media age, I grew up, I had an iPhone when I was 10 or maybe 11. I was on Instagram by the time I was 11, surely. And I am now like the human receptacle for every parent's horror stories about what's happening to their middle schoolers getting canceled for like a two second Snapchat video or someone screenshotted something and now everyone's seen it. And I think that one of the enforcement mechanisms going forward in the age of everybody having this insanely excessive digital footprint and all of their adolescent blunders being forever immortalized in a way that I think any older person should shudder at the thought of. Um, that's one way that it's being enforced is that there's an entire generation of young people who are coming up just surrounded by tripwires, even in their teenage years, that they're arriving on campus in college already primed for the fact that they have to self-censor, that they could be called out at any point in time. And I think that that's self-perpetuating because that's making less and less people even want to stick their neck out in the first place. But then I also think that cancel culture is is 
so dangerous and so powerful, not just for the people whose lives are torn down and completely ruined, but also for all the people around them that see that and see them having been made an example of and then will refuse and understandably so to tread that same territory. What's that? What's it called? Like a, a, a some kind of ideological bias test that people get asked. Uh, and it's almost like the culpably deniable shit test of of becoming uh, of working out where your politics are it's not part of some uh induction it's not even part of a code of conduct but people just sometimes throw a little question like what do you think about jordan peterson like have you ever listened to ben shapiro mm-hmm. have you done this thing and that's one of the more sort of soft introduction ways to this that slowly over time results in you being denigrated or or disparaged or made to feel other and um yeah, it, it's not just people calling for removal of accounts and bans and protests. It's There seems to be sort of a softer kind of alienation of people that have different views, which importantly is culpably deniable, right? There's no point mm-hmm. at which you've done the thing. Because I think that people who are seduced by the prospect of being a white knight or who like the idea of performative empathy because it makes them look moral whilst having to do nothing moral or people who just want to enact power – and Mm -hmm. enforce this over other people the game is beginning to evolve in the way that memes often do where if you it's now low status to be seen as someone that calls for cancellation because cancellation itself has become a meme so now the methods of cancellation need to become increasingly subtle Mm -hmm. they need to develop as the defense mechanisms develop as well yeah i mean i think it's it's i think we've seen less coordinated sort of twitter mob teardowns Although I would say that 2020 was kind of a uh, an exception to that, but to your to your example, um, or to your point, an example of that would be in 2020 and after the death of George Floyd. If you didn't post the black square, then that was a, a moral, the ideological uh, more shock test. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, there were people who I I have friends who were completely castigated and 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 unfollowed and blocked for not having done so i i mean i didn't do it and that wasn't didn't go over too well at nyu um but that would be the perfect example of like a a soft like do you buy into the prevailing ideology at that point in time um and i would also say to that point there's definitely like a a slow and subtle quarantining that i saw of when i was in um in classes at NYU and in my more philosophy oriented courses where it would kind of become clear that maybe one or two people are a little more heterodox and it was just like a slow people are going to start kind of sitting on the other side of the classroom when they come in if that person's over there um to the point where it was like this kind of bubble as though we were ill or there was something wrong with us. Um, and I, I've also watched how growing up that way has, I think, polarized young people even more. Because if you grow up, if you're being racially segregated when you're 14 on Martin Luther King Jr. Day and you're having political ideologies shut down your throat from pretty much day one, it's understandable why some people, especially young people, become the reactionary opposite or can go down some rabbit hole on the internet. Um, and like, I, I'm fascinated to see, I'm, I'm sure you saw that statistic that um, girls and boys are like forking politically right now. And I think there's- What do you make of that? Um, I, you know, I think it's, I think part of it is a little bit of a reactionary thing for boys and understandably so. I think that I- I tacked right when I saw how weird the left was around me when I was in school. But I also feel like politics are like there's almost a feminization of the left a little bit. And a lot of um, I think a lot of even cancel culture or or attitudes about free speech and, and needing to protect other people from harmful speech almost hijack the the female proclivity to be more empathetic or or to um you know, emotionally reason more than rationally reason, which is obviously, you know, you do all the whole like on average. And of course, there are exceptions to that rule. But I mean, even if you look at students' attitude on free speech and the percentages of students at various schools who will say that it's sometimes acceptable to respond to speech with violence, consistently, like the top five schools are all all women's schools with the highest percentage of people saying that they would respond with violence to speech. And so I do think that our political binary is taking on a little bit of a gendered tone. And then you also just have the 
the reality of growing up on the internet and ending up down rabbit holes, which happened to me politically. And I was like all the way on the right one year and then all the way on the left one year. And it's it's understandable how how that could cause a polarization, I think, for sure. Have you looked at Corey Clark's work? Do you know who she is? <laughs> Name sounds familiar. but Evolutionary psychologist, phenomenal. And she sent an email to every psychology lecturer in America. She contacted them all to ask mm -hmm. about uh, trends around self-censorship, uh, specifically looking at what sorts of topics. This Put it in the second book. It's so, she's so great. Uh, she was on the show a couple of months ago. And um, consistently, female teachers skew towards there are certain things that shouldn't be spoken about. There are harsher judgments that should be for the lecturers that do talk about this sort of stuff. And shock, horror, the two areas that were the most uh, derogated, the ones that you shouldn't talk about, behavioral genetics and evolutionary psychology. Why? Mm. Well, because there are immutable facts, or it posits that there, there are immutable facts, and sex denialism or sex difference denialism has no place to slot in in mm -hmm. either of those worldviews. Mm. Yeah, that's interesting. And I, I also to that um, effect, FIRE will ask students what issues are like the touchiest on campus that they feel that they can't speak about. And consistently, they're the most important political issues of the day, which is super disturbing. Like in 2020, all of a sudden it was racial issues. And then this year, um, affirmative action was like all the way at the top. And the Israel-Palestine conflict is always up there. And it's like the things that you would most want a college campus to be the forum of different ideas colliding in a in a an intellectual and robust and and healthy way. It's the ideas that are the the most touchy. Transgender issues are always at the very top. Or post Roe was uh, the issue of abortion, and it's 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 super disturbing to see that the things that you'd most want to have kids hash out, or at least hear and understand competing viewpoints on, are consistently the ones at the bottom of the barrel in terms of what they're actually willing to touch as well. Well, forget the fact that this is important to the development of a brain that's trying to work out what's true in the world. They're the most interesting things. Mm -hmm. They're the ones that, that, that are actually interesting to talk about. You decide to hermetically seal off a bunch of different things, and you're left with stuff that no one has a really strong opinion on or that no one can become offended by. And you go, well, by definition, those things aren't very passion-inducing. They're not exciting to talk about. Mm -hmm. So I think back to, you know, I went to uni... 2006, and I was at Newcastle uh, for five years, so I did two degrees while I was there. There wasn't a single point while I was there where politics even came in. I was doing a business degree. I was regularly in lecture theaters with 250 or 300 students, and there wasn't a single time when it came in. It was pre-Me Too, so I guess you know there was some reckonings kind of around social justice and male behavior and male female sex dynamics and 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 politics as well you know it's it's pre trump it's pre largely pre social media facebook was available the year that i went if you only had a, a university email address that was when it was still gatekept mm -hmm. by having a university email address so it was only for people that attended like uh, accredited institutions or whatever but that it, my experience at university despite being mostly boring was completely bereft of any uh, control. Like we were degenerate club promoters and and like gym bros. So I guess we may have disregarded them had they been there in any case. But I didn't notice any of this, and it makes me it makes me sad. It makes me sad to think that I I still have faith and I still believe that university is a very good formative experience because I look at the transformation that I went through. Absolutely, one hundred percent of it outside of the lecture theatre. But I look at all of the changes that I went through, and I think if I hadn't had that, I would it would have taken me significantly longer to have got to the stage where I was socially, uh, mm -hmm. in terms in terms of my life experience, in terms of my networking ability, in terms of how much business experience I got, all of those things. It was like a you know a, a crash course, a Navy SEAL hell week of just learning to be around other people and losing your keys and getting drunk and having an argument with a friend at three in the morning. All of the experiences outside of the university thing were important, but if every yeah. single one of them is coloured with this, like sword of Damocles that's hanging over your head in case you say the wrong thing. And now the fact that you do have a gullible surveillance state co-opted by volunteers that don't realize they're doing it, like 
someone has CCTV footage at all times. We had this idea. Mm-hmm. This is like the least academic insight into uh, uh, the proliferation of smartphones. Back in the day, we used to do a uh, T-shirt bar crawl called Carnage. And this was 2007, 2008, 2009. It was a license to print money. You put one of these things out and it just sold out immediately. And there was tasks on the back, things like pulled a pig, got off with three randoms, shop, swapped shoes with somebody. People would write the first half of the alphabet down the, the right side of their arm and the second half down the left side of their arm. And they'd try and kiss one person from each letter of the alphabet. Like this is classic mid noughties American Pie style, like university behavior. Mm-hmm. But one of the questions I asked a friend was like, where did that sort of Larry British sort of student culture go? And he said, as soon as the smartphone came around, no one could make mistakes on a night out without fearing that it would define them for the rest of their life. That you have, mm-hmm. you know, you kissed some person that's like uncool or embarrassing or whatever. You do it in 2006, people laugh about it and then it's either forgotten about or you can deny it outright and do whatever. But in the age of the internet, it's, you know, cemented online for the rest of time. And it defines you. Absolutely. I mean, and I think that the impacts on young people are so much more profound than we've even really started to talk about. I mean, I'm 23 and I'm just at like the the beginning of just burgeoning into adulthood and being the first cohort of people who are able to reflect back on what it means to have an a smartphone when you're 10 and to have the threat of anything popping up at any point in time. And any anyone born post-2000 who tells you that they don't have something unsavory somewhere that they would rather not have come back to haunt them is absolutely lying to you. I think we're ultimately going to have a ceasefire on this front because it's going to get so bad. We're never going to have a, a politician who um, can survive oppo research for the rest of time now that we've been so overly online. And I think the the sad thing to me is that young people demonstrably know this. Like I, the amount of of concern that I've heard from my peers and and from from people reaching out to me about their own children, um, and also the the polling. If you ask generations what their view is of cancel culture, positive or negative, the most positive view is millennials, and then it gets more negative as as you get older. Except for Gen Z, completely reverses that trend. So even though millennials have the most positive view of cancel culture, Gen Z has the most negative view, even more negative than boomers, because we grew up with it. Like we grew up looking behind our shoulders. But the problem is, it's a very small squeaky wheel, wheel minority of our generation that is at the helm of these cancel campaigns and will like Twitter shame their boss, but. The rest of us have not been given the the restorative kind of free speech oriented classical liberal set of values to supplant cancel culture. We just know we don't like this, but we're not quite sure how to fix it or put our finger on it or stop attacking people ad hominem and, and living in the realm of ideas. So I think there's a a tremendous amount of anxiety and unrest in being a young person who grows up unable to make social faux pas as everyone does when they're an adolescent or, you know, have their Marxist phase and then realize a couple months later that that wasn't for them, but that's part of growing up and exploring. And, you know, I think um, young people just really have not been taught the the values required to um interact in the intellectual world with the the epistemic humility of realizing that you might be wrong at any point in time and that anyone that you talk to knows something that you don't know um, and that your opinions aren't part of your personhood and and extending that same um, generosity and grace to somebody who you might be disagreeing with. Um, and I think that's really profound. And I also, um, just to go back to what you were saying on the, on the university front, like I'm, I dropped out of NYU with a 4.0 GPA, not because I have some sort of disdain for education and learning, but the really sad reality at that point in time in such an ideologically homogenous environment was that I had to drop out for my love of learning in defense of it. And it's not because I don't believe in the importance of education, but I think in its current form, it is so distorted. And these institutions of of higher education have just appointed themselves the sole gatekeepers to success in polite society and have had absolutely no market pressure placed upon them. And it's going to require more young people proving that it's not the only pathway to success to actually, I think, shake 
um, society from its complacency and challenge these institutions to actually be better and to serve people who are their patrons. Talk to me about the relationship between free speech laws and free speech culture. Mm, Yeah, I think that this is one of um, the most interesting insights from the book where you know, there are three countries with extremely robust free speech laws on the books, which aside from the U.S., almost to if you were to read them, you might think that it's the First Amendment. And they are Turkey, North Korea and Russia. So having a free speech law on the books means absolutely nothing if your culture and practice does not abide by them. Whereas on the flip side, one of the most vibrant points in intellectual history was the French Enlightenment at a point in time where there was absolutely no legal protection for free speech on the books at all whatsoever. But because there was a a salon culture and a a culture in which elites were interested in the free exchange of ideas and leaning into intellectual society, free speech was able to flourish. And I think that it's really important to realize that merely having the First Amendment on the books or merely having its equivalent on the books in another country is not adequate to actually fostering a culture that operates in a free speech way. Um, And there's a a great quote by a judge named Learned Hand, which does not really sound like a real name to me, but, and I'll, I'll bungle it, but roughly, (laughs) um, roughly the quote is that, you know, liberty lives in the, in the hearts and minds of, of every man and woman. And if it lies there, it doesn't need a court or a law to protect it. But if it dies there, no court or law can save it. And I think that we're seeing this slow and subtle cultural shift away from free speech norms that all of a sudden like throw social media in the mix and you can burn any heretic at the stake and it'll happen like that because it's it's really hard to grow up in the west today and realize just how crazy it is that we don't burn our heretics at the stake in the scheme of human history we live in like the teeny tiniest little sliver of time where we actually don't do that but all of a sudden now we're doing it in the digital sphere because that is mankind's instinct and so just having a law in the books doesn't really matter unless everyone buys in and actually abides by the the cultural code that that it is really required Mm, there was a really interesting insight I saw from the New York Post article that you guys did, where it was talking about how free speech culture and ideological diversity can make the world more chaotic. And because most humans don't like this, a good contingent of those people will happily trade their freedom for increased predictability. That if you're exposed mm-hmm. to new opinions and ideas that don't conform with you, you have to confront the fact that maybe you're wrong. And, mm-hmm. you know, accepting that you are wrong to the ego is tantamount to destruction. It's almost a, an invalidation of you entirely. Oh my God, if I'm wrong about this, what else might I be wrong about? And this denial of ever having to admit that we're wrong, especially in a world where everything that we do and say is permanently cemented on the internet for all of time for yeah. people to, to scrutinize. I thought that was very interesting. And I, I think from my perspective, that seems to be right. A more chaotic world with a multiplicity of ideological viewpoints and diversity of opinion is unsettling in many ways to people. And they will happily trade the accuracy and the truthfulness uh, and the freedom that they have in order to increase the reliability and predictability that they have about the world going forward. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that that's made even worse by the fact that polarization has, I think, made politics so much more tied to individual identity than it has been in the past as well. So an assault on your ideas feels like an assault on you as a person. And I think also to the the point of chaos, I mean, if we if we look back historically, we're in the very beginning ages of what it means to now have billions of people in the cultural conversation, thanks to social media, it's you know, been roughly a decade since it's been massly adopted or mass adopted. And if we look back historically, the, I think the best analogy is the invention of the printing press. And when the printing press was invented, Henry VIII was trying to license who can print a 
a pamphlet. And there were hundreds of years of religious wars as a result. And that was a really chaotic and uncomfortable time where I think it's actually pretty understandable why the powers that be and the people that were beholden to them wanted to squash out all the new voices that entered the cultural conversation and challenged the norms. And we look back and we think, well, that was a great thing. And literacy rates rose and that created the Enlightenment and the world as we know it. But we're still in that early kind of chaos days of social media. And I think the fact that things haven't gotten worse than they are at the moment is actually kind of amazing um, and, and a testament to the fact that there are still some people who do believe in, in free speech and, and the wisdom of the populace. But um, I, I think like the Twitter files just go to demonstrate how how threatening new voices in a cultural conversation can be to the social fabric and to um, the kind of levers of society. What do you say to the people who claim this isn't cancellation culture, this is consequence culture, this is just people being brought to account for having heinous, reprehensible views? I mean, I think that the the swath of views that have become cancelable offenses has grown so considerably. I mean, we just have like case after case in our book of um, there's there's one woman, Carol Hooven, who was a Harvard professor who, God she's forbid, went on Fox News and she and she's lovely and she's tactful and she's careful with her words. And she went on Fox News um, to discuss some issue of gender. She wrote the book T um, about testosterone and she extremely tactfully said, you know, we can respect people's gender identity and use their pronouns. However, we have to also acknowledge the fact that biological sex is real and on a on a fundamental level. And for that, she was effectively squeezed out of her job to the point where, and I know you know this story, but to the point where she she told us um, in an interview for the book that she was actually um, suicidal for the first time in her life. And so if the the group of cancelable offenses is now including acknowledging biological reality as a professor in your own field um, or, you know, going all the way down to now middle schoolers that whose parents call me constantly and, and reach out to me or email me um, to say that their seventh grader has now been canceled for something, which I mean, it's in seventh grade that just shouldn't even you shouldn't even be politically aware. You're worried about boys and acne and not politics at that point in time. Um, and just the sheer number as well. But if it really were about accountability culture, I think the truth that a lot of people who've witnessed these cancel mobs form um, can attest to is the fact that apologies do not make it better. It's not about saying, oh, I, I did tweet that 10 years ago, but I completely disagree with it now and I apologize for offending you because that doesn't fix it. It's not actually about making people account for the, any error that they might have made or any misstep it's about making an example of them and shaming them yeah it's having your morality stand on the shoulders of someone that you can easily accuse i mean the carol thing we went for breakfast me her uh william costello a couple of months ago and uh that woman cries more easily than anyone i've ever met she's like the most empathetic i think she cried six yeah. times on rogan like four times on my show she's just such a touchy feely lovely person that's really she delicately is. trying to move through this she's a really perfect example of whatever we want to call it like um soft mechanisms of cancellation because at no point did anyone come to her and say you can't teach anymore but every teaching assistant that she was supposed to be working with refused to help in her class so if you don't have a teaching assistant like how are you going to you can't do your class. And I mm -hmm. think she had one of the most popular, it was like quite a well-attended class yep. at, at Harvard. So it's like, okay, well, I guess I'm kind of like on the bench for now. And then when you're on the bench for that so long, you just end up kind of falling away. So, and it, it's so interesting to think that the, the apology doesn't make any difference because if that was what you were after, then the apology would fix the problem. It's like, hey, mm -hmm. that, that interesting. How interesting. I didn't know about this particular statistic about this thing because no one from an ideologically pure purity spiral, spiral driven world can believe that someone would be sufficiently epistemically humble to actually ever be able to say that. It's like, no, 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 no. This is you. Your identity and your opinions and your ideology are one and the same. You know, we saw this with <coughs> Rogan, uh, the <coughs> variety of cancellations that he went through a couple of years ago. And what people do, I thought it was really formative. People try and say, here is an individual instance or a collection of instances 
that may seem small here, but we know that they are representative of this big iceberg that lies below the surface. Mm -hmm. This is the, the smoking gun that tells you that this person is the bigoted, racist, transphobic, homophobic, whatever thing that we always knew that they were. And this is, this is finally the crack. The fissure has shown through this facade that they've created. So, all right, well, what you had with Joe and what you know, increasingly I would like to think people will see with other online content creators or writers or, or, or anybody, all right, well, that might be true. But I also have 5,000 hours of him talking to people on podcasts and it didn't come up then. So he's either the best liar and, and deflector of his bigoted racist views in history, or that's unrepresentative overall. Mm -hmm. And it, I don't know, it seems to me like, I would like to think people give what used to be called the benefit of the doubt, but I don't know, that, that seems to be increasingly rare now. Yeah, I mean, I think that also to that point, the benefit of the doubt is often given to anybody's like ideological friends, but then it's precisely the opposite if they just don't like someone instinctively. Um, and I, I think... You know, it's been instructive to see like Rogan survive cancellation attempts and and Barry Weiss to make a career out of it, basically with the free press and the awesome stuff that she's doing there. Um, or Chappelle and and seeing Netflix finally actually toughen up and and um, say no to their employees that were trying to wreak havoc over a single joke. I mean, I do think that there have been examples of of cancellation going so far that there is a band of people who are willing to come around and actually support you and champion you as a result. And I think that, that Joe Rogan's a perfect example of that. Um, but I, you know, I worry that those are only people who are in a powerful enough position when it first happens to them that people know. Um, and there's so many just like unheard stories or even, I, I think that, one of the problems is like, on a college campus, it's much easier to quantify how often this is happening because people often have legal recourse. But in, in the private spheres, it's impossible for us to tally how many people have been canceled, not only because some people will just shut down and never say anything, but also because there are so many examples of people who will talk to you off the record about it, but they've signed an NDA because that was their their severance agreement with whatever yeah. company they were squeezed out of. Um, and, you know... Um, Jennifer Say, who left Levi's, she refused uh, to sign an NDA and and turned away a million dollars of payout to um, because she had criticized COVID policies and school lockdowns, which apparently means that you can no longer be an executive at Levi's. Um, but you know she she refused to sign an NDA, and we only know that that even happened because she she had the spine to actually say no, I want to maintain my intellectual autonomy. But um, yeah, I mean, I think that there's there's so many high profile teardowns that thankfully people are starting to land on their feet and support one another. But, um, you know, I fear that the 2024 election will be another wave of all of the same stuff. And I, I'm not feeling great about the future of cancel culture in the near future. So, Oh yeah. Um, what, what are your predictions? Give me, give me the weather report moving forward for the storm front of cancellation. Yeah, I think I am hugely concerned about 2024 as is my co-author um I, I especially considering that we have such polarizing options on both sides of the aisle I am I am very concerned that 2020 and 2016 ha were just like little trial runs for how how polarized and how ad hominem we're about to get um, at least in the U.S. And I think that, you know, the the ripple effects of American politics are really felt across at least the English speaking world and often just the cultural West in general. So I am not feeling fabulous about the near future. I'm extremely nervous as we seem to be um, kind of just powering ahead towards an election between two historically unpopular incumbents. So um, I don't know. I'm not feeling great. But what what are your predictions on on that front? Do you think that the social unrest is going to continue? It's a difficult one. I would guess yes, because the memes of production for creating trends online and going completely super viral have become more sophisticated. Like, this is one of the things that's interesting 
people look at the algorithms on social media as if they are the things that give us the content, but they also train the content creators. So if you think that the memes that came out in 2016 were sophisticated and built to limbically hijack you, and if you thought that the things that happened in 2020 were, oh my God, like look at all of this stuff, wait until 2024. Each time that it comes back around, there is a new iteration of people and sometimes AI now creating stuff mm -hmm. that is even more compelling, that's even more outrage inducing. So I don't know, I'm in Texas, so I feel a little bit like I'm insulated from anything sort of too crazy. Even being in Austin, people call it a blue dot in a red ocean. I've never seen any of the blue dots here. It just seems to be like <laughs> just a red ocean. But um, yeah, it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be very interesting. And I don't know, you, you, it's so right to say that most of the people that survived their cancellations were people who already had tons of momentum, you know, Chappelle, Rogan, JK Rowling, et cetera. Um, mm -hmm. And there's definitely a part of some sides of the cancel mob picking fights with people that they know can't fully defend themselves. You know, like Carol Hooven, again, is a good example of that. Like she's so kind, it was obviously going to emotionally impact her. If you're someone that mm -hmm. even knows, has even seen five minutes of her on a podcast, you know that this isn't someone that's going to come out of the gates swinging like Dave Portnoy, right? It's someone yeah. who's going to be very uh, impacted by this and also doesn't have a million person Twitter where they can wrangle mm -hmm. a huge audience of people that come around. And also, like... <laughs> What's the lesson to take away from that? Everybody should have a huge mailing list of email addresses. Everyone should build up a massive sub stack as like a yeah. <laughs> break glass in case of cancellation thing. That's not realistic. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and I think that, um, I think that we're only seeing just the beginning of, of how profound that's going to get. I, I worry about 24. I worry about every single moment of cultural unrest that we have going forward unless we actually return to the values that make a diverse a diverse democracy possible i think that um that's pretty much impossible and we will end up going towards a marxist sort of divide and conquer situation which makes enemies of everyone unless we actually can start looking at viewpoints and and living in the realm of ideas and the realm of of personhood in two separate planes. Um, and so I think until, until we really have a cultural reckoning and it gets really ugly, which I think it's coming in the near future. Um, I don't think that, that things will get much better, but I'm curious you. So Austin is not as blue as, as they say it is. I don't know if it's me just spending time with lots of bigoted, reprehensible people, uh, like neurodivergent degenerates, but it, they <laughs> seem to be, they all seem to be like, you know, relatively free speech, relatively open to new ideas. Um, I mean, yeah, I, I, I haven't seen, I mean, there's like some stuff, stophavingkids.org does like this goth parade every year down Broadway. There was some stuff to do with like pro-lifey things, but that's not, that's not because it's blue. That's just a, a, a variety of opinions being shown via street protest. Um, what else have I seen? There was a pro-natalism conference here two weeks ago. Uh, you know, they, there's a, a lot of different stuff going on. It doesn't seem to be very heavily controlled. Um, thinking about that, though, you know, the complete unlikeliness of people building up some huge online platform so that they can then deploy it to protect themselves in case of being cancelled. What are the potential solutions to this? Beyond make it worse so everyone hates it more and then it gets better, are there any yeah. more <laughs> fluffy solutions than that? Any less apocalyptic ones? Of course. Um, yeah. So we the the final section of our book is solutions oriented. And I think um, a lot of it is just throwing everything at the wall and hoping that something sticks. But we think that parenting is a large portion of it, um, especially with young people and that a lot of the um, – the, the sense that words can be violence and wound you are the result of helicopter parenting and and a um, just complete abandonment of the sort of ideas of anti-fragility that prior generations were raised with. Gen Z was very coddled and protected and made to be anxious and feel as though they're feeble and um, endangered by the world around them. And my co-author, um, his previous book is The Coddling of the American Mind, which um, concentrated quite a lot on parenting and its impact on politics and Gen Z. Um, and so we think that there's 
a lot about leading by example as a parent and raising kids who will not be cancelers and understand their own vulnerability as well as the vulnerability of their friends. Um, and I, I do f- find a tremendous amount of hope in the fact that young people are so put off by cancel culture that if they were just given the positive restorative framework to fight back against it and um, kind of a social pact that would be mutually protective, that there's, there's some hope there going forward. Um, we also think that divesting away from the the elite university system just being the only way that people end up in in positions of power in society is a, a healthy thing um and that people who are hiring um should consider kids coming from large state schools and kids from different backgrounds or people who didn't finish college or people who went down a different path and that we shouldn't just have this funnel of kids coming from consistently the the most elite schools or the schools with the worst attitudes towards free speech, which I think it's no surprise that we're seeing uh, absolute chaos erupting on campuses like Harvard right now. Because if you abdicate free speech and you suppress students and and send bad ideas underground for decades on end, all of a sudden in a moment of cultural unrest, they're going to explode. And that's precisely what we're seeing right now. Um, And so we believe that, you know, opening our minds to alternative education systems and not allowing these schools that seem to breed cancel culture and cancelers to, you know, take the reins of society consistently with every graduating class. That's a positive. Um, And also even people who are running corporations uh, can, I think, take one note out of Netflix's book after the Dave Chappelle controversy where they said, you know, if you can't tolerate the fact that we are going to publish viewpoints that you disagree with as as a platform for ideas and expression, then you can leave. Um, I think that's that was a remarkably unique and brave stance to take. And actually, Coinbase did that um, a while ago. Their CEO, Brian Armstrong, was like, we're just not going to t- make any institutional statements. And if that's a problem for you, you can go. And like 10% of their employee base did actually go. But like that's not the 10% of people that you want to work for you. So I think um, on the the level of corporations, we can um, – I think there are a lot of – we hear frequently, Greg and I both – from corporate leaders who are terrified of their like 23 year old hires. And that's just such a bizarre power imbalance. And it's very fixable if you just create a free speech culture from the get go. But I also think weirdly um, after October 7th, there's a lot of people rediscovering the importance of institutional neutrality and of free speech and free expression. And, you know, it's, I think it's a really revealing moment for schools to suddenly say, oh, you know, we had a statement about Kyle Rittenhouse's acquittal and BLM and all these completely irrelevant things to the interworkings of a university, but we can't make a statement on this. Of course, I think it's it's shocking that this is the moment that they've fin- finally discovered that institutions are full of people with viewpoints and do not have viewpoints themselves. But maybe there's a silver lining that this moment of just absolute chaos in in institutions where free speech was not valued for so long, where they're suddenly hiding behind the valence of free speech. Like maybe this is where we actually buy in and we realize that we're all vulnerable in a world where a liberalism is allowed to reign supreme. What would you say is a piece of advice to someone who is threatened with cancellation or is going through it? Have you got a, a to do and not to do checklist for those people? Yeah, I think um, obviously it's it's so dependent on the level of support of people around you. But I think the most important thing for everyone who is concerned about cancel culture to say now as as an individual before anything happens to them or anyone that they know is that if someone that you know and care about and like is attacked, you commit that you will stand up for them. It's not that I I agree with their viewpoint, but they're a good person and tearing them down is not the right thing to do. And I think that if we afford that to other people that, um, and hopefully expect that in return from them, if the the mob comes for us, that's one way to fight back. I think the power of someone else standing up for you is really profound. And unfortunately, cancel culture thrives because everyone else is scared to stick their neck out there. And like when I was writing about free speech at NYU for the New York Post, which is not really the most popular thing to do, surprisingly, um, you know, I have so many people messaging me and saying, oh, I completely support you and I completely agree with you, but just don't tell anyone that we had this conversation. And that that's got to stop and we have to short circuit this. But 
on the front of if you actually are targeted with a cancel culture attempt, it's funny. This is actually a point where my co-author and I have, have a little bit of disagreement where he says never apologize under any circumstances, period. And I don't fully agree with that. I think if it's something that you would apologize to a friend for or something that you genuinely didn't mean, I don't think you apologize and try to placate the individual who's treating you unfairly. But if you genuinely don't agree with the tweet that you sent when you were 14, because who does, then I think you say, that's not me. But I don't think that you ever try to placate the mob. That's the number one thing is if someone is attacking you unfairly, you don't try to respond to that with with undue rationality when or ever compromise and apologize for something that you don't actually feel any remorse for, for sure. Ricky Schlott, ladies and gentlemen, where should people go? They want to keep up to date with the things that you're doing. Where should they go on the internet? Um, my Twitter is just my name, Ricky Schlott and rickyschlott.com. And um, I think probably by the time this comes out, I'll be launching a new podcast um, under Bill Maher's umbrella at Club Random. So um, that will be forthcoming in 2024. Very cool. I enjoy the prospect of you joining me in the muck and the mire of the podcasting world. I'm super excited too. I've been learning from you. I'm doing all my homework, uh, waking up to modern wisdom. So thank you. My pleasure. I really appreciate you. Thank you for today. If you enjoyed that episode, then press here for a selection of the best clips from the podcast over the last few weeks. And don't forget to subscribe.